So that fellow couldn't join the church. He couldn't join the church. He couldn't get baptized. He couldn't get baptized. He woke up with God. He woke up with the devil. Are you saved? Amen. So that fellow didn't take the sacraments. Didn't take the sacraments. Didn't say the rosary. Didn't take the rosary. Didn't tithe. Didn't tithe. He went to heaven. He went to hell. You saved? Didn't keep the law. He didn't keep the law. He broke the commandments. He broke the commandments. He didn't keep the golden rule. He didn't keep the golden rule. He woke up in glory. He woke up in the pit. Are you saved? Amen. You're saved. If you're not saved, you're over here or you're over here. You sure ain't in the middle. He said, Lord, remember me, thou comest by kingdom. And Jesus turned to him and said, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be saved. It's like that. You have been saved? Yeah. If you ever saved, you were saved like that. Yeah. All right. In this video, I just really quickly want to talk about what is going to transpire here soon. And what we're actually going to see is Revelation 12 unfold. And what we see in Revelation 12 is a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, a crown of 12 stars. This represents Israel, as this represents Joseph's dream of Israel being, rep as all the tribes, the family, represented by the 12 stars in the sun and the moon, and how they would all bow down to him in his dream. And the interpretation was Joseph's mother and father and all his brethren bowing down to him. And just real quick for the people who think that this has to do with Mary, I understand why you think that. I think Mary is the personification of Israel. But in this instance, it's not talking about her because this woman flees into the wilderness for three and a half years after Jesus ascends, because it tells us about how she gives birth to a man-child who is going to rule the world, but that he is caught up to heaven, and then the dragon comes after the woman. This is something that's prophetic that has to do with the future, not with the past. Mary never had to flee into the wilderness after Jesus ascended to heaven to escape some kind of persecution. I mean, if that happened, everybody would bring it up to prove that she is this woman from Revelation 12. Uh, but the facts are that that's not the case because what's going on with that man-child be, being taken up and there being war in heaven is the rapture. When we are raptured, there's going to be war in heaven. And Satan and his angels are going to be cast down. And what's going to happen here on earth is World War III. Just like when Lot left Sodom and all of a sudden there was destruction, the same thing's going to happen when we are taken out. When we're taken out of the world in the rapture, sudden destruction, God's judgment, God's judgment in the world to come in eternity is hell. God's judgment is in this world, in this life, is war. And there's going to be world war. It's going to be nuclear. A whole lot of things are going to go down. It's going to be very destructive. And this is because it's mirroring what's going on spiritually. Spiritually, Satan is trying to keep his place and accuse us who have been saved. And when we're taken up, he's going to try to fight that because he knows his time's up. And we are replacing him and his fallen angels. So we go up, they go down. So World War III is going to go on here. And there's going to be an increase of UFO activity. And then uh, people are going to see, quote unquote, aliens. Uh, but these are really fallen angels and devils, or as people would call them, demonic creatures. And maybe they'll call them extra dimensional beings. But they're all fallen angels and they're coming to deceive the world and it's because they've been kicked out of heaven you're if you haven't accepted the gospel you haven't been born again and you're still here 
know what just happened was Revelation 12. The man child taken up, war in heaven, Satan and his angels are cast down, and now Satan knows he has about sh but a short time. So he's going to try to deceive the world because he's going to try to continue this war. He's trying to regroup. But you see, it says that Satan took a third of the stars, a third of the angels with him. So he's outnumbered according to the by angel two to one. Not only that, all of us who are raptured, we're taken up. So Satan is outnumbered. So he's going to try to recruit as many people as he can to take his mark. This mark is going to change people because it's going to genetically mix you with the fallen angels, with Satan himself, so that it changes you. So you can be, quote unquote, superhuman. And not only that, this mark is going to be something that connects you to technology with nanobots, uh, something along this line to connect you into a hive mind through like Wi-Fi, Internet kind of connection. And this is to get you to be one body with Satan, fight against the one body of Christ, as Christ is going to return and he's going to destroy Satan's kingdom here and establish his own for a thousand years. So Satan is going to try to get you to side with him to fight against Jesus, against God himself, and try to deceive you into thinking that he's the good guy. Uh, it, it's kind of like... Uh, the Transformers movie, where you have these Autobots that show up, right? And they're saying, oh, the people who are coming, the Decepticons, you, we need to team up and fight against them. They're the bad guy. And it never occurs to them that the Autobots are actually the Decepticons. And that they are deceiving the people into thinking that they're the good guys, when ultimately they were the ones kicked out of heaven because of their crimes. But since you're ignorant of that, they take advantage saying, oh, we're the good guys. There was a rebellion and they kicked us out and we need to fight back to restore order. When ultimately they're trying to bring about a coup to overthrow God and get you to join with them. So they're deceit, trying to deceive you into doing it. So when all this hits the fan and it, it's, it's pretty close. We know World War is, it's... It's just right there on the edge where the economy, it's shaken. Like it, it looked like it was about to fall. It's still barely chugging along. Uh, but that's not going to keep going, especially if Russia, China, Iran, North Korea, and others just abandon the dollar completely. And then they don't sell oil and exchange oil using U.S. dollars. That's going to mess up the economy. Because the U.S. dollar is backed by oil. And that's why I tell a lot of people, Americans, who are like, yeah, we should look at different energy sources besides you know, oil and what have you. It's like, yeah, that's great. But there's a problem. You have to make a sacrifice because the dollar is backed by oil. If you're going to get rid of the oil and change your uh, means of energy, uh, you just devalue your, your, your currency. And it's not worth anything anymore. Right? So you got a big problem there. All right? You, you just destroyed the economy in pretty much the nation, unless you have some kind of backup, some kind of alternative, which they'll, they'll bring out. They're already working on those digital currencies. That's, again, tied into the mark of the beast. Can't buy or sell without it, right? That's how he tries to force you into his, his ranks, right? To coerce you into it, because that's the only way you can survive, right? If you don't take it, you don't join up, well, then screw you. That's basically his mentality. If you're not with us, you're against us, and he's going to put you down, right? So uh, I just wanted to make a quick video talking about that, uh, about all this coming along. As we know, it's just heating up, the anti-Semitism heating up. Uh, that's how it's planned out. That's how it's been prophesied. We, we see it's right at the door. We know time is just about up. We are just about out of here. And uh, that's both exciting and terrifying. It's exciting because 
we get to go to heaven, we get to see God face to face, we get to know all that stuff, but it's kind of terrifying because we're also going to be judged, and uh, we're not going to be found perfect, we're going to be found ashamed of our lives, and that's not going to be fun, and not looking forward to that, and then you don't know the people left behind, uh, you know, you, you kind of rooting for them, but you just don't know, right? It's kind of scary thinking about if they're actually going to pull through. Uh, but uh, if you're watching this after the fact, just know we're rooting for you. Even though you rejected the gospel, that's all right. You got yourself a second chance. Praise God, right? Second Passover. You get a chance to still make it through. And But that's your last one. Right? You take that mark, you're damned. You, you think, oh, I'm going to make this sacrifice for my family. All right, well, you just damned your soul. Right? So, uh, yeah, don't think that you can take the mark and you're going to be helpful to people because it's going to change you from the inside out. Just like those who are born again are changed from the inside out where you become more and more day by day renewed into the image and likeness of Jesus. And fit for heaven. When you take that mark, you're going to be changed from the inside out to be more and more like Satan. And you're going to be his tool. So don't think you're going to be you when you take it. And that you're still going to use it to help your family and friends and anybody else. It's not how it's going to work. You you do damned your soul. You're going to suffer and die because you rejected Jesus' suffering and death on your behalf so now you're going to have to suck it up and pray God gives you the strength to get through that so thanks for watching and take care all right I just wanted to make a quick video here to put at the end of all my videos encouraging you to prayfully get into the scriptures as we read here in Hebrews chapter 12 at verse 2 it says Looking on to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And this is very interesting that it refers to Jesus as the author of our faith. An author is somebody who writes. And in Romans chapter 10, verses 16 and 17, it says, But they have not all obeyed the gospel, for Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So you see here how Jesus is the author and finisher of our, finisher of our, of our faith. And how you get faith from hearing the word of God. Jesus is the word of God. The Bible, the scriptures are the written word of God. It is God in our world. It's God's representative in our world. And that would be the King James Bible. And if you're saying it doesn't say read, it says hear. Well, then read it out loud, my friends. I know some of you are wise asses, and that's what you're going to say. Well, then read it out loud. And you build your faith. And you notice how obeying the gospel here is about believing it. That's how you obey it. The gospel is the good news of our salvation. That Jesus Christ died for our sins, was buried and rose again according to the scriptures. But coming back to the word of God here, we are told in Isaiah 34, 16, Seek ye out the book of the Lord and read. This is very fitting because Isaiah has 66 chapters, just like there's 66 books in the Bible. And if you do a study on this, you can see that each chapter of Isaiah lines up with each book of the Bible. The first chapter for Genesis, the last chapter for Revelation. Have fun doing that. And why should you seek out the book in the, of the Lord and read? So that Jesus never tells you this, ye do err, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God, as we read here in Matthew 22, 29, when he's talking to the Sadducees who were coming to him with a very silly question that anybody could answer if they actually knew the scriptures. But you see the Sadducees they didn't use the whole Old Testament. They just used Moses. So they didn't get the light from 
the Old Testament to help you understand the Torah. Just like the New Testament shines light and helps you understand the Old Testament. None of it adds or removes from what Moses wrote. It helps you understand what Moses wrote. That's why Isaiah tells us here in Isaiah 8 verse 20, to the law, which is the instructions, the Torah, what God told Moses to write, that's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the first five books of your Bible there. It says, to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. So you see, you test the people to see if they actually have light in them. There's people who have an outward show of light, as Satan himself can come as an angel of light and his ministers as ministers of righteousness. But how do you test the spirits to see if there's truly light in them? They have to line up according to the scriptures. Jesus was not afraid to be tested in the scriptures. He would say, have you not read? It is written. To search the scriptures. Bring them up. They testify of me. Right? He wasn't worried about that. Paul wasn't either. Acts 17, 11. He wasn't worried about being tested in the scriptures. He didn't make some nonsense about you can't understand the scriptures. You need me to interpret them. No, he, he actually called the Barians noble for hearing what he had to say and then searching the scriptures to see if it was so. Because that's what we're supposed to do. If you don't line up with the scriptures, you're not of God. Very simple, very easy. God made it very easy for us to know him and to know who is not of him. He gave us his word and it's super simple. If it doesn't line up with him, then obviously it's somebody else trying to say that they're from him. A stranger. Trying to kidnap you, right? And what does Jesus tell us about the word in John 17, 17? He says, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. So you Christians that want to be sanctified and you're trying to sanctify yourself by repenting of all your sins so that you become sinless. You want that sanctification. You need to get into the word because when you have the word abiding in you, God changes you from the inside out where you're not making the change where you sanctify yourself by becoming some sinless being, by focusing on your sins and fighting against them. No, that's just cleaning the outside of the cup and containing your sinful nature. You need to come to Jesus to be born again, sealed with his Holy Spirit and become one with his spirit. And as Jesus says in John 6, 63, his word is spirit and it is truth. Flesh profits nothing. You get into the word. You are partaking of the Spirit of God, and God's Spirit is life-giving, as we see in Genesis, bringing life to things that have no life. You want that life. You want to be sanctified. You need to get into the Word. As we're told here in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 25 through 27, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the Word that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So how do you receive this cleansing? By getting into the word. It is spirit. The spirit is in reference to water. You want that cleansing? Get into the word. That's where you are going to be sanctified, so that you would be without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. No blemish whatsoever. You need to get into the word so that Jesus is abiding in you, and you are abiding in him. You see that? So, moving on to this last verse here, John 17, 3. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. Because the only way to know the Father is to know the Son. You can't come to the Father without going through Jesus. When you know Jesus, you know the Father, because they are one. Jesus is the Father in the flesh. And eternal life is to know them. That's why Jesus says in Matthew 7, to these people who are doing a lot of great works in his name, they're prophesying in his name, they're casting out devils in his name, they're doing many mighty works in his name. And Jesus says, I never knew you. You see, you're saved not because of your works, not because you repented of your sins, 
not because you're perfect and you've deserved it and you've earned it somehow, that you've proven yourself. No, you're saved because of your relationship with God. If you've come to the cross and have been born again, then you are sealed with the Holy Spirit of God. You become one spirit with the Lord. There's no way Jesus can say, I never knew you, because he knows you. He made you anew at the cross. He knows you intimately. You're saved at that point. You need to have that deep relationship with God. Just as Adam knew Eve and she conceived, you need to know God on that level where you are born again. You receive the word of God, which is the seed of God, into your heart, which would be your womb. I know as a man you might not want to think of that, but that's how it is. Eat the humble pie so that you receive the seed of God that you may be born again. You see, the women help us understand our role to God. Because to God, we are the bride, the bride of Christ. We are as the woman. So you need to eat the humble pie, receive the seed, so that you can be born again. But a lot of Christians, they are just like a lot of women today. We don't need a man. So they're never going to be born again. Right? A lot of Christians, we don't need God. We can do it ourselves. And they take on the name Christian. Christians seem to be the easiest people to fool. Because all you got to do is say you're Christian. And they'll follow after you. You can be preaching lies because they don't test you to the scriptures. Donald Trump is a good example of a lot of Christians just blindly following him because he said he was Christian. Even though when he asked was asked if he comes to Jesus to ask for forgiveness. He says, no, no, I don't really do that. I, I don't really see myself as a bad person, and I just try to do better. So he's not a Christian. He's never been born again. He doesn't believe the gospel, the good news of our salvation. He doesn't even believe he needs it. Yet the Christians are holding him up as if he's Christian and as if he's the, the savior of our country. Right? They're making an idol out of him. And he obviously, he's a pompous ass, right? The only reason why he looks good is because the left looks so bad. If it wasn't because of the left looking so hideous, you would be able to see clearly that Trump is no better. He just says what you want to hear. But then somebody like me who preaches to you the truth, but then I might say a word you don't like. Like I might say shit or ass, and all of a sudden you're offended and you turn off the video right here saying this guy's not a Christian, you never listen to a thing I say, because I said a couple of words that the Bible doesn't say not to say. The Bible doesn't say not to say any words like that. It says not to have corrupt speaking and guile. Corrupt speaking is what you get from politicians like Trump. That lie. And that's what guile is. It's manipulation. Fake feigned words. Flattery. I'm not doing that. I'm not speaking anything corrupt. I'm just instead of saying crap or butt, sometimes I end up saying shit or ass. And me saying that right now, you probably getting mad. And that's probably because you're immature. Christian, or not even Christian at all. You're just Christian in name only. And that's why you follow fake Christians so easily. So if you're offended by such things, have fun. Go away. You're not breaking my heart. You're, you're not taking anything from me. You're only hurting yourself by rejecting the truth and following after bullshit. So thanks for watching. Now I'm going to splice into something from Rockman that I really enjoy for the end of this. Take care. That fella couldn't join the church. He couldn't join the church. He couldn't get baptized. He couldn't get baptized. He woke up with God. He woke up with the devil. Are you saved? So that fella didn't take the sacraments, didn't take the sacraments. Didn't say the rosary, didn't take the rosary. Didn't tithe, didn't tithe. He went to heaven, he went to hell. You say? Didn't keep the law, he didn't keep the law. 
He broke the commandments. He broke the commandments. He didn't keep the golden rule. He didn't keep the golden rule. He woke up in glory. He woke up in the pit. Are you saved? You're saved. If you're not saved, you're over here or you're over here. You sure ain't in the middle. He said, Lord, remember me, thou comest thy kingdom. And Jesus turned to him and said, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be saved. It's like that. You have been saved? If you ever saved, you were saved like that. 